Because you go to bat for your friends when they're facing challenges. Because you go to bat for your friends and they tell you what they need. And frankly, I don't think that's been happening very much over recent years, whether it's over COVID, sovereign debt, access to climate finance, or the speed of World Bank decision making. That is all the more important from the UK perspective, because let's face it, there's too much ignorance, laziness, and let's be real, a bit of racism that is reflected in the way that Africa is spoken about in this country. Emphasising respect is frankly the right thing to do. And having the correct attitude and making it visible in all our actions is massively important for the success of UK diplomacy in Africa. Because trust is understandably limited. We've all seen over recent years that disinformation can be increasingly effective around the world, but also in Africa. And I believe that's a legacy of past failures, which have created an environment in which mistrust can thrive. Not just the abuses of the colonial past, but failures over recent decades too. Trust has been impacted by serious issues like COVID vaccine inequities and perceptions of double standards over Ukraine and now Gaza. And I believe that the chaos of conservative rule has had a serious negative impact too. This rages from the brutal overnight aid cuts that caused us to break the promises that we made. The disruption and the loss of expertise caused by the botched merger of DFID and the FCO. Right up to the very late and poorly communicated cancellation of this year's UK Africa Investment Summit. So what I'm trying to say is that when your engagement isn't wide ranging or respectful, you make yourselves vulnerable to false narratives of adversaries from outside the continent who will exploit just that. The UK isn't the most vulnerable among the European middle powers, but we can't rest on our laurels. So respect has to be an absolute bedrock. It should go without saying, but unfortunately, I think that in today's day and age, we have to say it and say it out. And I believe that very little progress can be made unless we start with humility, because our resources have limits. And equally, I believe it's important for us to move away from the hyperbole about global Britain. It's as if the UK does nothing that's worthwhile unless it's equal in scale to a project by the US or China. Let's be frank, it's a nonsense and it holds us back from what we can actually achieve in partnership with our friends on the continent. And in the conversations that I've had, there's a huge appetite for joint working that will help us to overcome resource constraints. I think we need to centre African leadership when it comes to development finance. And in that, we can look to the African Development Bank, for example, and Africsum Bank. And equally, we need to be ready to see or seize opportunity, pool resources, for greater impact with our partners, like Germany, Japan, France, Canada, Brazil, India. The list of possibilities is long. No longer can we be held back from these opportunities by hubris. Our attitude towards the Africa strategy should be framed with high ambition for what our partnerships can achieve. More than anything else, the refresh that Labour wants to see in the way our country engages with Africa is one of positivity. Our narrative is one of mutual benefit, cooperation on common challenges and supporting locally designed partnerships and solutions. Official development assistance has to be seen as one set of tools in our toolbox, integrated into a government-wide strategic approach. I don't want to overstate this, because my friend Lisa Nandy, our brilliant shadow cabinet minister for development, is making absolutely clear that the word development doesn't just mean aid. It can and it must mean working together on common challenges. 
Obviously, I work on humanitarian support when crises occur. It's never again been the primary focus of our relationships with Africa. Instead, Africa, of many African development priorities, including trade, investment, debt, and climate finance, are going to be immediate priorities for us in government. Lisa and I agree on this 100%. So, that's the starting point, establishing the right attitude, respect, humility, ambition. And I believe that for our strategy to embody that proper attitude, we need to engage in Africa at many different levels. Country to country, diplomacy is the bread and butter, but there's a lot more complexity that we need to understand too. Because so many of Africa's strongest agendas are being pushed through at the continental or regional level, through the AU, the African Continental Free Trade Area, SADAC, ECOWAS, the East African Community, and IGAD, so the G20, and for better representation in UN decision making. For me, this is about a fairer and more equal world. It's about supporting those longer term pan African goals, but equally finding ways to, to deepen day to day joint working with African institutions. I'm under no illusions. This ain't going to be simple and it ain't going to be easy. Policy at continental and regional levels is obviously contested by African states, including areas where the UK very much needs to support positive agendas such as security co cooperation, trade integration, and digitalization. We have to recognize it ain't always going to be best for the long term to pers pursue a short term quick trade deal if there's a risk of undermining regional trade and industrial policies. The Conservative government has plainly been preoccupied with the completion of Brexit and rolling over as many EU partnership agreements as they can to justify their Global Britain slogan. But I believe that we need to recognise the potential for improvements, particularly when it comes to supporting value-added manufacturing across borders and enhancing the mutually beneficial services trade that's frankly our bread and butter in the UK. And the EU now seems actively engaged in updating some of these agreements, but there's little sign of interest from the current government in following suit. This leaves us in a really concerning situation where we've inherited many of the flaws of existing trade agreements in Africa, but there is no clear agenda to improve them. I'm really interested in hearing views about this alongside my really good mate, Gareth Thomas, from our business and trade team, who honestly will make a phenomenal trade minister. Because we both recognise that the developing countries' trading scheme is there as a baseline. But does it demonstrate the ambition and the long-term commitment that we want to be at the heart of our Africa strategy? As I said, if there's interest in revisiting trade agreements with African partners, this isn't something we can do purely based on a country level knowledge and engagement. We need to be working with the grain of wider policy frameworks in our bilateral partnerships. And I suspect that will require greater expertise at regional and continental level too. So we can navigate these policies effectively. University networks and industrial policies that we can bring to the table in partnerships. And as a counterpart to that, David Lammy, our absolutely brilliant shadow foreign secretary, has set out our intention to build an international clean power alliance of countries committed to going further and faster in the net zero tradition. transition. This is an incredibly important agenda for both of us and I think also for our African partners. And we need to start from humility and to recognise that many African countries are in fact closer to their ambition of 100% clean energy than we are. With very few exceptions, Africa is not a continent with a climate mitigation problem. Different solutions to support African states 
to continue their rapid expansion of access to renewably generated electricity. And by doing so, we can help bring down energy costs and increase reliability for industries. My hope is that we'll be able to set our offers of deeper partnership over the coming years with some of our African friends within the Clean Power Alliance. Ultimately, as we know, many African economies are impacted hugely by volatility in fuel prices and the coercive and corrupting foreign influences that can sometimes go along with that. Countries from across the global north and south have a common interest in standing together and sharing expertise, technology and financing to protect and accelerate our economic transitions. And there are other aspects of the clean power agenda that highlight massive mutual interest between the UK and Africa. Crit critical minerals and green hydrogen will be essential for decarbonising parts of the UK economy. The UK has a strong interest in expanded, more secure and fairer supply chains for these goods. But the current government has done little to set out our offer in Africa and establish the partnerships that we need. I firmly believe by doing so, by drawing on the City of London's strengths in financing minerals investment, we can better support African value chain agendas. So we need to be saying loud and clear that for the UK, this is not about demand for primary commodities, but expanding finances to increase the diversity of crit critical mineral production and its processing. <coughs> this is one aspect of opportunities for mutual benefit. Let's be real. We're learning from the experience of recent years when geopolitics has created serious economic harm to families and communities here in the UK in the form of the cost of living crisis. Equally, we know that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has damaged the whole world through its impacts on inflation and food insecurity. And these experiences have thrown the spotlight on potential geopolitical risks further in the future, primarily east of Africa. We need to work together, I think, to demonstrate that African ambitions around industrialisation fit effectively with this Huronomics agenda. Ultimately, if a wider range of goods, including critical minerals, are available for trade from African manufacturers and ports, that could seriously benefit the UK in the future, particularly in the event of another unwelcome geopolitical turmoil. And in many ways, to turn back to industrial policy in the global north creates greater alignment with the emphasis on the role of the state in development that many of our African friends share. I truly hope that never, ever, ever again will outdated free market ideology be pushed onto Africa by outsiders with no regard for local or regional priorities crisis of violence have spread and deepened across the Sahel, the Horn of Africa and the Great Lakes regions, just to name a few. My constant call on the government over the past years has been to actively support African solutions on peace. I think we need to start by being realistic about the barriers that have held back African leadership on peace and security. There's no one set of causes. In the Horn, African leadership is obviously impacted by the very significant influence of the Gulf states. This has made it more difficult for the African Union or IGAD to coordinate the international response. In the Sahel, the leadership of ECOWAS has been massively undermined by Russia's strategy of supporting chaos and insecurity. And a part of Russia's strategy involves exploiting social divisions and promoting an ineffective, narrow and brutal interpretation of security. It's based on mercenaries, crackdowns on all forms of discontent and opposition, endless 
unaccountable military rule and punishment massacres of civilians. The steps to tackle conflict drivers that are rightly emphasised by the African Union, such as climate heating, humanitarian needs and development and security sector reform, they're not just absent in what Russia is pushing, they're effectively made impossible by it. I'm not at all interested in defending the failed security interventions of the last 15 years, but I think in many places there's a scope for a refreshed offer of partnership that helps to tackle conflict drivers and peace buildings, which will back up the agenda and the leadership of ECOWAS. And in Sudan, the lack of coordination from the international community has allowed the generals to wage war on their own people, to indulge in a theatre of mediation, repeatedly switching forums to avoid pressure. In my view, none of this, though, should dampen our enthusiasm for supporting Africa's security institutions and their peacemakers. But I think we have to be smarter and we have to recommit to using the UK's diplomatic networks and other resources to bolster African leadership. There's so much more I could say about these enormously complex and vital issues. And I'd love to talk about how excited I am about the work being done on climate resilience and anticipatory action by institutions like Africa Risk Capacity, and that's, how, and that's connected to the loss and damage agenda. I'd love to talk about how we might use UK strengths the insurance and finance industries to support the work, that work, at a larger scale in the future. But given my emphasis on respect and humility, I want to give our expert panel and audience members a good amount of time to further this discussion. Let me end on just one point. For me, the commitment to an Africa strategy is not just about some internal document that's going to sit on a shelf. Under the Tories, the Africa strategy has been so weak and so disengaged, it's almost like it doesn't exist. Labour's approach could not be more different. We welcome submissions and opportunities for discussions, not just with their excellences, but from civil society organisations and from academics. I want this conversation to start now, before the election, so that if the British people trust us with government, we can get to work straight away. Together, I believe, we can shape an approach that could guide our relationship with African friends for years and decades to come. Based on respect, humility, and ambition for what we can achieve. 